in the previous uh, several lectures, we were talking about helicopter rotor in hover, vertical climb, and also vertical descent. We looked at various ways of computing the aerodynamic loads all over the blade from root all the way to tip. And we also looked at how to estimate the power needed to climb and also the power needed to hover. So we looked at various losses that happen, such as a non-uniform inflow, tip losses, and we also came up with empirical corrections or approximate fixes for these losses. Now we are going one level further. We are looking, starting to look at the steady level forward flight. This particular series of lectures would be done over multiple videos. So we are going to start with uh, some introductory remarks to start with. As we had mentioned in our very first lecture on helicopter aerodynamics, the problems in the forward flight are too many to list. This picture captures some of them. So the helicopter is in forward flight, so the air seems to be coming from left to right. This is the forward velocity v infinity. We need to give it a vector direction, set up a coordinate system and so forth. So we will do that shortly. So we see the rotor disc here. So the main purpose of the rotor is uh, in hover is just to produce the thrust upwards because the only force that we need to overcome is the weight of the vehicle. But in forward flight, in addition to providing thrust, we also need to provide the propulsive force. That means of some what a forward forward directed force. That means this thrust cannot be pointing straight up vertically perpendicular to the gravity direction of gravity along uh, along the direction of gravity but it needs to be tilted slightly forward so we need some mechanism for tilting the thrust vector forward as needed to produce enough amount of uh, propulsive force forward because the faster you go the higher the drag of the vehicle so the more of this thrust has to be pointing forward we already talked about the complicated aerodynamics that takes place on the rotor blade we know that at the tip region, velocities co complement omega r, the blade is moving forward at omega r. V infinity is adding, so you get very, very high velocities in the tip region. So that can give rise to sh shock waves. The shock waves can increase the wave drag. That means the power consumption goes up. Shock waves can cause the local boundary layer to separate, so-called shock in your stall, and also the shock waves can propagate farther out and they cause uh, the noise to be heard like a sonic boom. On the retreating side, the opposite thing happens. The blade is going in this direction, omega r. The wind is chasing at v infinity. Therefore, the relative velocity between the blade and the wind is omega r minus v infinity. So in the inboard regions that omega r may be too small, v infinity may, may be too large. Then the flow may be going from the trailing edge of the airfoil towards the leading edge, so-called the reversed flow situation. And you are also going to get regions where you are getting very, very low dynamic pressure, very low velocity. And the rotor is still trying to generate lift, but when you are trying to generate lift at very low velocity, the rotor may stall. So there may be a region here where the rotor stalls, then it gets attached here because you get plenty of dynamic pressure here. So you go through uh, what you call a dynamic stilly stalled, dynamic stall, unstall, stall, unstall type of a situation. In an earlier lecture, we said we produce too much lift on this side, too little lift on this side. Therefore, flapping hinges are necessary or some kind of a flexible beam called a flex beam so that the blade can flap up. So when it flaps up, what happens is it produces a downward directed velocity which reduces the blade angle of attack. Here, the blade will flap down, producing upward directed velocity, increasing the angle of attack. The combination of low forward velocities and the increasing angle of attack will cause dynamic stall as well. Or, alternatively, you can pitch the blade down here because you have a lot of dynamic pressure. You don't need so much CL. You may increase the pitch up here so, so that you have a high lift coefficient. Low dynamic pressure, but high lift coefficient. That means you are cyclically varying the pitching 
or as you go round and round and round, in addition to what we call the collective pitch. So in forward flight, in addition to the collective pitch of the blade that we saw in Howard and in some of your homework problems and in your quiz, now we are talking about cyclically varying the blade pitch angle. The blade is elastic, therefore it can bend, it can deform, it can torsionally twist, so elastic effects need to be taken into consideration. Blades generate tip vortices, so the tip vortices may interact with the following oncoming blades. So this is like a mini tornado. It producing a inflow on one side of the vortex, upward directed flow on the other side of the vortex. So imagine this vortex crossing the following blade here. Then on one side of the blade you see a downward directed velocity, on the other side of the blade you see an upward directed velocity. So the lift is going to abruptly change during the encounter between the tip vortex and the blade. Then the blade, blade kind of moves forward. So this brief encounter is called the blade vortex interaction. During that time, the loads abruptly change on the blade because of the increase in the upwash and downwash changes. And uh, that causes vibration that also generates noise. So this is the aeroelastic response we talked about. Furthermore, we have main rotor interacting with the tail rotor. The flow from the main rotor is the tail rotor. Main rotor interacts with the vertical tail. Main rotor interacts with the horizontal tail. Because the inflow through the rotor now is unsteady because the rotor is spinning and things are changing sinusoidally as we just talked about. So this unsteady flow, when it hits the empennage or the tail, is going to produce a highly unsteady environment which will cause the, blade, the vehicle itself to bob up and down, or yaw, left to right, pitch up and down, you name it. And there are other uh, interaction effects such as uh, rotor airframe interaction that we need to worry about. So there's plenty to go about, lots of work to do, and the whole flow is unsteady, by the way. We can no longer use a table lookup of CL versus alpha, and CL versus CD like we did in Hover, we have to come up with some kind of an unsteady table lookup if we want to use a table lookup. So there's plenty of problems. This is keeping all of us awake at night, but also in the terms of researchers, it's keeping us fed with our graduate students, research projects, papers to publish and so forth. So it's a very rich area of research. <clears throat> so the dynamic pressure, as I mentioned to you, by the way, this is the blade behind the. Uh, this is the blade behind the pilot. This is psi equal to zero. This is the blade in front of the pilot. This is over the tail boom. This is over the nose of the fuselage. <coughs> this is the oncoming free stream. So as far as the, when the blade is at 180 degree azimuth or zero degree azimuth, free stream is going radially. So you get some radial flow effect, but uh, in this direction the velocity is simply changing linearly. On the other hand, at psi equal to 90 degrees, the velocity adds up as we talked about omega r plus v infinity. Then it changes linearly because the omega r linearly changes as you go from root to tip, uh, tip to root. How about here, it's omega r minus v infinity. Then again, this is linear behavior takes place. There is a region here where the velocity is negative. That means it's going from the trailing edge towards the leading edge, what we call the reverse flow region. So very high dynamic pressure, very low dynamic pressure. So once per, uh, so you have a variation in the loading simply because the blade is rotating as it's moving in the forward direction. So not only do we have the variation, the aerodynamic loads radially like we saw in Hover, like in our homeworks and our quiz, but now the loading, eroding is also going to change azimuthally. So it's a function of r, but also a function of psi, where psi is the azimuthal angle. By the way, omega is the angular velocity in radians per second. So as a consequence, just to list some of the things we have already talked about, the dynamic pressure sinus hardly changes. It's got a high harmonic content. This excites the air, it changes dynamically the air loads 
which excites the structure, structure starts vibrating, and above a some forward speed, these vibrations can exceed safe operational limit. Basically, you cannot fly at that uh, in that regime anymore because of the vibrations, even if you have plenty of power. Again, on the advancing side, you have very high dynamic pressure. This is the advancing side. So shock waves form, shock induced storm forms. You also get a too much of a lift because one half of velocity squared, the velocity is very, very high. So the blade may need to flap up, producing a downwash, or pitch down, that means say, reduce the angle of attack by rotating the blade nose down. On the, on the retreating side, the dynamic pressure is very low, therefore the blade has to flap up or pitch up to produce the required lift. Because um, power flight, as a consequence of these things, total lift decreases as the power speed increases. Remember, you're also getting stalled flow on some parts of the blade here. So the rotor behaves like a very, very low aspect. There's only a small region where you produce use, usable lift. Here you're getting shock-induced stall. Here you're getting dynamic stall. So the rotor behaves like a very low aspect ratio wing, if you will, in forward flight. That means it's got a very high induced drag, therefore a very high power consumption. So all of these things have to be considered. So how can we handle it? There are three ways we should do it. One is uh, what is the performance analysis, how much power is needed just to turn the main rotor. Then we worry about all the other things. So it's called a performance analysis. That's the first part. Then we need to discuss what happens to the blade. How does it flap up and down? How, what, how much shall I pitch it up and down? What should the pilot do? How do I keep my thrust pointing just in the right direction so that some of it overcomes the lift and weight, some of it provides the forward directed thrust. How do I predict the aerodynamic loads not only azimuthally varying but also radially varying because I need this aerodynamic loads to com compute the vibrational analysis, force response of the blades for the aeroelastic coupling between the aerodynamics and structural dynamics and also for noise purposes. So we'll be looking at uh, some of these aspects, elements, in this particular sequence of power flight topics. So we will stop this video at this point and continue with the additional videos uh, shortly.